Hello Defcon, welcome to my talk, Racketeer, Prototyping Control Ransomware Operations. My name is Dmitry Snashkov. I work at Portivity on Attack and Penetration Testing Team, where I have a chance to do tooling, offensive research, and automation. And today we're going to talk about ransomware. Specifically, we're going to talk about simulating the lifecycle of ransomware, injecting into it, understanding it, and emulating the steps that need to happen to properly test it. Um, our talk is going to be split in two phases. The first phase, we're going to talk about uh, the problem, construction of a solution from architectural uh, perspective. And then the second, uh, the second uh, part of the talk is going to be the demo where we dive in how the operation happens, what, the, uh, what makes the Racketeer Toolkit tick. Let's start. Uh, so ransomware is definitely a technical issue. Um, it's implemented in technology, but what fascinates me about ransomware is it's just a, such a good business model. It is just an efficient economic exit activity from, um, from cyber attack. Uh, imagine that the bar of entry is low on the technical side and uh, tooling is available and uh, encryption of the files, you know, locking of the files can happen almost immediately once the uh, dropper actually gets onto the box. Uh, so you don't really need, as in the ransomware uh, uh, deployer, actually go to the second or third tier in the network, on the customer network. You can actually monetize right there and then. Also, you know, all the features that the cost of uh, deploying ransomware is much smaller than a lot of other um, cyber offensives and um, with advent or actually use of crypto monetization activation path, uh, path is fast right you can actually say that even the attribution is getting much uh, uh, much more fragmented than before and obviously with such a business model uh, it's no wonder that uh, ransomware has grown about 330 percent year over year growth so um, if that's such a good uh, business model, how do we emulate the testing for it? How do we inject into this? And how do we make sure we can actually uh, trace what's going on, understand its capabilities and uh, react to it? Well, traditionally, obviously we need to contain, uh, we need to uh, keep on with uh, preventative and detection controls because ransomware is just another variation of offensive uh, on your network. Uh, you, abs you absolutely need to go across teams for disaster recovery drills, uh, you know, do your incident response triage. And uh, one more thing is to add external negotiation with the ransomware party uh, as part of your tabletop exercises. But so just like everything else, uh, a lot of times you can detect or prevent things. Uh, you can actually minimize uh, mean time between failures. And this is what Racketeer tooling is uh is attempting to do is achieve is is essentially trying to emulate the path and the life cycle of ransomware and uh, allow the teams to kind of get in the middle of that um, and the way you do this is uh obviously you need to know your assets and data that ransomware may target and uh you need to perform simulation and feedback and that simulation and feedback is what we're going to talk about but before we move on, uh, let's just distill the life cycle of ransomware into three things, literally. It's the persistence where the dropper actually executes the task on the assets, uh, be it you know, files or anything else. Um, then there is an extortion capability, which uh, may or may not happen in sequence. Uh, you can have offline negotiation. You can have online uh, kind of IOCs popped in that says, hey, you know, you have T minus 48 hours to pay us or else. And then uh, from the ransomware perspective, there's a D stage or decryption uh, capability that has to happen and potentially clean up, right? Uh, if, you, if you care about leaving the network intact, not causing denial of service. And so the objective of uh, Racketeer tooling is to refine that process of injecting into this life cycle to help teams uh, on whatever side of the story, whether it's the uh, tabletop uh, to support the incident response and triage, whether it's providing optics into uh, TTPs and uh, actually doing a uh, collection of indicators of compromise that can, you know, that the teams can learn from. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously play towards the red team side where the objective is to implement the last mile delivery of ransomware in your objectives 
uh, through your campaigns. Um, obviously, you know, for us as testing, uh, as testers, we have to obey, abide by SLAs and it's good practice to keep uh, uh, the network intact, not uh, denial, do not perform denial of service on it or cause denial of service. And so uh, this is why we're calling our uh, toolkit controlled prototype of ransomware, right? It's a controlled run where we have precise targets, where you have kind of a balance of stealth uh, and uh, openness. So you can both uh, showcase the capability, but also open it up to defenders to kind of inspect things. Uh, so if it is a ransomware simulation, uh, what technical features does it need to have? Um, well, as we talked about before, we need to be uh, correct and reliable in locking and unlocking assets because we want to make sure that the customer stays up, uh, stays up. Um, you know, uh, real time encryption versus offline uh, decryption of of assets very useful because there are, there are circumstances in ransomware campaigns where decryption and encryption happens separately or the agent dies and you should be able to bring the assets back into the unencrypted form as much as you can. Um, obviously, dormancy and activation, uh, dropping the agent on, um, on the network does not mean it's going to get active and start encrypting things, right? We have to manage that. And because of that, we have to have flexibility in communications and specifying targets and all that good stuff. So let's just try to build one. Um, what would be the good agent for our, uh, our purposes? Well, let's just target Windows because it's the most prevalent uh, kind of target for ransomware historically. Obviously, that can be adapted to Linux or go cross-platform. Um, but uh, in this case, we're going to take a look at encrypting local files on Windows and also encrypting uh, remote files on Windows by going uh, you know, across the network, for example, you can remote into a different box uh, through that agent and kind of do the encryption of assets there. And obviously, we need to have control of execution, as we mentioned before. Um, the other technical uh, tactical features that we want to have in this uh, agent is uh, lifetime key management and key generation. It has to happen offline as far as generation because of you know, both stealth and convenience. If you want to have offline capability to decrypt the, the assets, you should be able to do that. Um, and then we work through policies. We load policies into the agent. The policies have to be flexible. They need to carry profiles with them as far as how you connect to the box, what user ID you're using, how do you shield credentials, uh, all that good stuff. We mentioned offline asset recovery. And uh, because of that, uh, we actually have uh, an operation on a, a hub and spoke model where a commander uh, accepts the agent and then manages it there. So, you know, from the construction uh, of those of those features, what else? Um, we have to have communication emulation, how ransomware usually interacts, obviously encryption on transmission layer, uh, but also application level message encryption for the agent. Uh, that's become very prevalent and we need to be able to kind of inject into that, um, you know, it operates on uh, or emulates a ransomware that does REST uh, communication. It's your uh, pub sub uh, uh, type of deal where you come in, ask for the test, uh, tax, task, uh, execute it, upload the results and whatnot, right? So everything is sort of distributed in this way. What else do we need to do? Well, we mentioned the uh, uh, policy, but it also needs to be hot patching. So we need to be able to encrypt the assets, but we also need to be able to back out from the same policy so we don't lose uh, correlation of the keys. Again, real time or remote, whichever the case may be. Uh, if we are testing customers and we are soliciting for credentials, if we need to, need to, for example, impersonate a user to go to a remote box on the network, uh, i.e. literally, uh, laterally move to it, uh, we want to make sure we uh, uh, put uh, security on credentials, right? We don't want uh, clear text uh, creds, so we're doing uh, some encryption on, um, on, on, on that, uh, credential shielding, right? And then, um, obviously, we need to be flexible in how authentication maps happen. If we are going from one domain to another domain, from non-domain to domain, we should be able to employ various profiles for connectivity on the network itself. Um, so that plays to flexible operations. Uh, what else? We also want to have 
uh, kind of mutual authentication between a C2 or a commander, if you will, and the agent, uh, so that the agent knows who their C2 is at, at the time of uh, deployment and, and, and creation. And also C2 wants to accept only the agents that it knows about. Um, and so that kind of plays into the delivery options and how agents get triggered. Sometimes you hard code the policy into the agent to, uh, let's say, get a moving on air gap network without C2 interaction, where you can drop uh, in, in, in you can you can have an agent on the network and kind of start encrypting things right away without accepting tasks from C2. Or uh, you can you can go the old route where you dormant until activated, right? Some uh, notes on stealth versus transparency. Uh, one of the problems in ransomware is not not knowing what's going on once uh, agents are deployed. So we want to make sure we know at all times what's going on. Um, so we run logs um, on, on the agent, but those logs are in memory and we're able to retrieve and uh, kind of introspect, get some optics into what's going on. And then obviously, you know, one of the uh, interesting features or needed features in our testing is to be able to um, kind of uh, clean up after ourselves, uh, killing the agent, uh, popping up notifications that has been ki killed or, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, removing the uh, the threat from the network on their own. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about the policy. Uh, and so the policy is what ties everything together. Right, you have flexible connectivity to C2s. You have profiles on connectivity. You've got uh, authentication maps that match credential triplets to uh, to hosts that they go to on a domain or not. Um, you also have a flexibility on key generation and whether you're encrypting assets with one key per host, or you can have flexibility where you have separate keys for uh, each file or uh, mix thereof. You know, you can have you know, situations where uh, you can you can kind of tier the priority on file uh, files. So if one key is recovered, the other one stays um, stays kind of uh, encrypted as well. So um, this brings us to to a demo uh, where we can talk about uh, specifics of deployment and operations of uh, Reketeer Toolkit, and we'll come back to discuss other things later. Let's take a look at the operations of Reketeer. Here we have four windows. There's a C2. There is a utility box that helps manage encryption and uh, master keys, site IDs, as well as decrypt encrypted files offline. And on top, there are two windows that represent simulated attack uh, attacked network. There is a non-domain join machine and there is a domain join machine. And so our task for Racketeer is to go out and use the agent that gets deployed on the non-domain machine to manage, i.e. encrypt, the assets on it and then pivot over to the domain box and do exactly that on the other side. So before we talk about the execution of it, we'll like to take a look at the uh, policy file. So the policy file, as we've discussed, is the one that ties the, um, the tasks, communication, encryption keys, and authentication profiles for the agent as seen by the operator from the outside. And uh, there are multiple sections to it. There's connectivity section with various profiles and security of communications. There is a REST uh, profile and uh, endpoints that it needs to talk to. There are keys such as master key and identifier of the site for the agent. And there are also a series of authentication profiles that take the triplets, username, password, and domain, or operate on a local asset. And then there is a uh, array of hosts and files that uh, file uh, connector or the agent is able to operate on mixing and matching host keys with file keys. You can repeat these sections as many times as you would like to. This is very contained operations. And so um, in order for us to, uh, to task the agent with execution, first we need to start the agent on the remote box. It starts up and we can see that it's running under PID 1940. Okay. Then what we can do, we can uh, activate it. Right now it's in the pending state. Let's activate the agent. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to accept the agent to be 
uh, as part of our communication, which means that we only accept the agents that are um, that are the ones that we know about. Okay. Then um, what we can do is we can uh, authenticate the agent to the to the C2 and the C2 to the agent by specifying the master key you've created before. And so we can send the master key to the agent, at which point it will know that it's talking to the uh, C2 that it knows about and has been um, kind of paired up with. And then what we can do, we can actually do send the policy, which we have specified before. This policy is going to encrypt the assets across the board. It will take a while for it to respond, uh, usually within the uh, profile that you've specified, five to 10 seconds or more. And as you can see, the agent actually operates on the assets locally and then goes out using the authentication profile to the domain and encrypting the assets on the other side. And as you can see, those assets are encrypted as we're gonna see in a moment. They are locked and the customer is kinda you know, forced to operate under, under those conditions. And the same thing happens here. But uh, the other thing that we need to be able to do if we're not ready to decrypt offline is we're actually reversing the policy. And the reverse of the policy is just a matter of specifying the operations type. Flip a bit on encryption and decryption. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna flip that policy back into, into, the, um, into decryption mode. Same thing, Paul exec file decryption with the same keys that you specified or you can do one by one decrypt one file all the files none of the files this should work and once this once it uh, decrypting the file we will be able to see the content um, as it was there before and uh, essentially everything should be back to normal one other thing that i would like to mention is the uh, the execution profile in the memory so we can we can get the logs uh, looks at debug on the logs which means that it will increase the verbosity of the agent and we can do logs get on it and we'll be able to see what it's doing there and the obviously you know to align with our uh, directives of working with uh, perhaps triage teams what we can do we can uh, kick off a tabletop exercise and pop popping up um, a uh, notification message on the agent or on the uh, on the host where the agent resides that basically says uh, I am here why don't you take you know start taking care of what I'm doing here um, and uh, we can do this with on hiding console message, which will basically lock the box, show the uh, notification, and then the triage process happens. Now, obviously, last but not least, is that we can agent self uh, terminate um, to uh, clean up after ourselves. This will destage the agent, and it will be the box will be clean uh, with all the assets intact. Uh, or uh, the variation on the theme is when agents are locked and the uh, or the files are locked and the agent is no longer in memory. How do you recover uh, your assets? Is you talk to the ransomware team and ransomware team by using the utilities in the utility box are able to use the keys that they've specified in the policy to decrypt files one by one or all. This is Racketeer Toolkit. Okay, we're back. So what can we do to, uh, what, what, what does it tell us? Uh, it tells us that we are able to kind of simulate the life cycle of controlled ransomware, right? Uh, we are able to maintain SLA and uptime on the network, uh, try to deliver the last mile modernization module, module for the teams that need it. Um, and uh, kind of plug in into the response process, uh, either to support it or kick it off, um, and also learn more about the ransomware and how you know the deficiencies are and uh, capacity of it is. So um, 
uh, for defenders, um, I, I think uh, it's safe to say that uh, let's not signature this tool, but do pay attention to behaviors because uh, artifacts uh, may be minimal because it's all in 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 memory, right? But uh, TTPs still exist. The lateral movement, the sequential. Uh, encryption of the files so all of that is still present so uh the bottom line is that iocs are tied to implementation uh and and the agent has been uh deliberately weakened to uh, showcase the um kind of the injection points and analysis points and obviously instrument your environments where you correlate operational performance and security messages and with that i want to thank everybody who's uh who's listened looked at the uh at the demo Watch the demo rather. Uh, here's the uh, here's the link to uh, open source uh, code for the Racketeer. Thank you very much.